What year did you go to Vietnam? Um, 1966. Landed in about the third week of February. How old were you then? Uh, was uh, 20 by a week. And where did you go to basic training? Uh, Paris Island. Did you? Mm-hmm. And uh, Marine Corps boot camp? Marine Corps boot camp. Do you remember your first day boot camp? Uh, yes, I do. The first morning and f yes, I do. Pretty crazy, huh? Um, yeah, it was. It was, uh, it was something pretty tense. Now you joined the Marine Corps. Yes, I did. Why did you decide to join the military? I knew I was going to join the Marine Corps early on. Uh, my grandfather had been in the Marines in World War I, and in fact, we have the discharge papers and a, of a relative of ours who was on the USS Providence uh, and retired in 1790 or something from the really? Marines. Huh? Interesting. So there was a long family history of that. Uh, did you feel a sense of duty, though, to serve? I mean, during Vietnam, how were they? What was the mood of your peers and even the country then? It wasn't so much a sense of duty as it was a young adult looking for adventure. And as I said, I can remember in sixth, seventh, and eighth grade reading about the Marines and knowing that I was going to join the Marines. I mean, that was just a given. I didn't share it with anybody particularly. Um, and I, like I said, I joined for some adventure. I mean, got uh, more than I thought I was going to get, that's for sure. Was there uh, something in particular, maybe the history of the Marines that got your attention, you think? Well, the, I think the history, uh, and my grandfather, having spent uh, time in World War I, he used to tell these amazing stories. Uh, he was a caisson driver, and he had a six-horse team or a six-mill team, and he would run ammunition and shells from the supply depot up to the front lines, and he would tell of his adventures, and uh, I was pretty much always fascinated by them. So you go through boot camp, and during, in boot camp are you thinking that you are going to go to Vietnam, you might go to Vietnam? I had never heard of Vietnam. Um, I didn't know about Vietnam when I joined, uh, that was uh, the summer of 64. Um, I went to boot camp, got sent up then to uh, duty station with the combat engineer unit at Camp Lejeune and still hadn't really heard of Vietnam. And then there were whisperings about it. Um, I wasn't reading newspapers. We didn't have TVs really in the barracks. And I went on, on leave with a guy named Danny Taft. Yeah, he lived in Bessemer, Alabama, and he wanted me to come home with him. And he, he said, we'll have a great time. Okay, so I went home with him, and we would had a pretty good time, but he wouldn't leave till midnight, and it was an eight-hour drive. So uh, I wanted to leave earlier. But anyway, we're driving in the middle of the night, and uh, he's falling asleep, and he says, talk to me, talk to me. So I start talking. I said, listen, Camp Lejeune's boring as hell. I said, let's go to Vietnam. He said, oh, yeah, that's a good idea. We'll go to Vietnam. And uh, we get in. We just made formation at 8 o'clock. Right after formation, I go right over to the first sergeant's office. He goes, what do you want? I said, well, I want to go to Vietnam. He says, how much time you got left? I said, three years. He said, well, you're right for it, aren't you? I said, yes, sir, I am. I want to go. He said, you want to leave this Friday? I said, yeah, that'd be great. Uh, he said, you want to go home first for 10 days or 20? I said, 10 will do. He said, I'll have orders cut. He says, you're out of here. So I went to the noon chow hall to find Danny. And I said, well, Danny, I said, did you go see the first sergeant? He says, see the first sergeant for what? To go to Vietnam. He says, that was just talk. He said, that was just talking at night. Go to Vietnam. I said, well, I went and they're cutting orders. He says, I ain't going. I ain't going. So he, I went over there and what was really ironic, just uh, cosmic. My last day in Vietnam, they pulled me out of the field. They sent me by helicopter back to Da Nang to headquarters. I'm waiting in line for some hot chow and I hear this guy call my name and I turn around and it's Danny Taft. And he was, he had just gotten country the day before. His fatigues were still starched. He didn't have a suntan. And I said, what are you doing? He said, well, I just can't. I said, see, if you were to come when I came, we'd be going home now. Uh, and then I heard he lost a leg in Quezon. That he, in fact, he asked me, he said, well, where's Quezon? I said, I'm not sure. He said, oh, OK. Um, I didn't see him again, but, and I don't know if, that, if he did or not. That's what I heard. So you haven't seen him since then? Huh? Haven't seen him since. Tried to find him? Um, no, no, I didn't. Um, That's an interesting story. Mm -hmm. Tell me about your first day in country, what you remember, uh, where you were, and, and uh, if you got off a plane, and, and go ahead and take a break. 
we were aboard ship. Um, we boarded ship in January in Okinawa, and they sent us uh, on a 33-day cruise around the Pacific, one stop in Subic Bay, and then there was Operation Double Eagle, which was a landing, uh, a Marine Corps assault with the Amtraks. And <clears throat> I said it was the biggest landing since uh, Incheon. But it was probably the only landing since Incheon, so I guess it was the biggest. But uh, we got in the assault boats and hit the beach, and uh, there were mama selling popsicles. Welcome Vietnam, Marines, popsicle, five cents. We thought that was funny. Um, no action that day or the next day. About the third day, things started heating up a little bit. Where was this in Vietnam again? Well, I'm not quite sure where. Um, in northern, southern Vietnam, around Da Nang and Chu Lai area. So, t you know, Mitchell, you're trained, you're a Marine, you're in Vietnam. Um, do you, did you ever feel invincible, like nothing could happen to me? And when did it all change where you realize I can get killed doing this, man. Well, I did feel invincible, but I wouldn't call it that quite. Um, it never dawned on me that I could get hurt. It never really dawned on me anybody was going to get hurt. I mean, we're just going to Vietnam. I'm going to be in the Marine Corps. And uh, within 10 days of landing, went out on Operation Utah, which was the first, maybe the second major engagement with uh, Marines and NVA regulars. And at the end of that second day, then I knew that there was going to be a problem, that uh, I wouldn't survive many more days like that, and I was very fortunate to survive that day. Can you tell me what happened that day? Um, well, when I look back on it, it's, it's amazing to me. We were hanging around headquarters one day, and about 4 o'clock in the afternoon, the sergeant comes and says, pack your gear, get the ammo and food for six days. So it's 5 o'clock at night. Where we? Where, and uh, we saddled up and started walking. And we walked all night. We walked all the next day. The next night, we had 50% alert, two-man team. Somebody stay awake at all times. Got up the next morning and just had finished a little cup of coffee, and these jets come in and start dropping bombs and 20-millimeter uh, cannons. And it should have dawned on me then that, that that wasn't a show for us, that there was uh, something out there that they were wanting to soften up or whatever. And uh, then that battle started about 9 or 10 in the morning and uh, went till just about dusk, just about dark, and uh, stopped. And at the end of the day, there was only 18 of us left uh, out of 36. Uh, it was one of the few times that our whole platoon, we were in an engineer battalion, combat engineers, and it was one of the few times our whole platoon was assigned to an infantry unit. And I can remember I can remember that very clearly, uh, in a sense like it was yesterday. Uh, what, tell me a little bit about the combat, what you encountered and what your role was in all that. Um, the combat was, uh, it's like in the movies. Um, a lot of dead people laying around, people wounded and screaming. Uh, uh, I can't remember hearing anything with all the uh, shooting that was going on. Um, but people were getting hit regularly. I mean, uh, uh, we were up against a uh, crew serve machine gun, um, and they had us pinned down. And uh, this gunny sergeant Downey, uh, he was probably 38 or 40 or 35, an old man to us, and uh, had a pretty good belly on him. He liked his beer, and. Uh, we were about out of ammunition. We were just about out, and he gotten shot in the shoulder by a spent round. Uh, the round was a, a M1 carbine, and just as it coming down, but it just lodged. You could see the base of the bullet sticking out, but there was a little blood dripping down. And he didn't have his shirt on, and he kind of went berserk in a way. He uh, grabbed a World War II Thompson machine gun and one hand grenade, and he run up at that gun emplacement and firing from the hip as he's running, and he throws that hand grenade in there and kills him. Uh, and he got a silver star for that. Uh, and as I remarked then and now, uh, it was pretty much just like in the movies, except it wasn't a movie. It was the real thing. Um, Corporal Morales got shot right in the groin, just, just below where the leg joins the torso, and it smashed his femoral artery. And uh, I don't know if he made it or not. 
uh, he was pinned down. We put him on a poncho and we picked that poncho up and the blood just ran off in like a bucket. Uh, and I can remember that he was yelling for his mother and just in anguish yelling for his mother. And that bothered Sergeant Campbell because he told him to shut up, shut up. And Morales did. He didn't hear another peep out of him. Uh, Campbell himself got shot a few minutes later, and Sergeant Shelton, and uh, one guy that I can't remember his name from Baltimore. Uh, people were getting all shot up, and I think we, they, we either killed them all, they retreated, or they ran out of ammo. But at the end of the day, those of us who were still up were up and taking care of business. Um, what I remember is stacking dead Marines. Uh, like cordwood, maybe 12, on top of that 12, maybe nine, on top of the nine, maybe six, waiting for the helicopters to come in. And it didn't bother me much, uh, some of course, to see dead NBA, but seeing dead Marines was unnerving. I mean, that was a whole different ball game. Uh, never, never got used to it or over it, I guess. Uh, so this is this Operation Utah you're still talking mm -hmm, about? Mm -hmm. How, tell me the role of helicopters in and out of these areas or that time. Period. Well, at that time, uh, the Marines weren't using helicopters. We could get medevaced. Uh, if you got wounded or need resupply, they would fly in helicopters. They didn't have Hueys. Uh, I forget the name of it that they had, but it was a very ancient looking helicopter. And we walked wherever we went. There was no... Uh, being taken in by helicopters. Uh, they would resupply with helicopters and uh, take out the wounded, but essentially we, we always walked wherever we went. Uh, didn't see helicopters much. In your job again, you were... I was on a demolition team. I had went to school at Camp Pendleton uh, to learn about shape charges and diamond charges and C4 and TNT. And, uh, so I was in a combat engineer platoon and my training was in demolition. Well, so what kind of work are you doing while you're there? I mean, Well, uh, if I wasn't out in the field, uh, I was helping build uh, chulai, build frames for the tents and uh, boardwalks. Uh, most of the time I was out in the field. And when I was out in the field, I always had a 20-pound satchel of C4, uh, some deck cord, uh, fuse, and uh, never had to carry the blasting caps, of which I, I certainly would have carried them, but uh, you can throw them on the ground and they'll go off. They're, they're sensitive. And they had a, had a box that was like a cigarette pack with holes drilled in it and it was filled with uh, felt. And you put the blasting caps in that little box, put the top on, and then carry it uh, in your shirt pocket. Um, I was act, to be asked, to be truthful, I was glad I didn't have to carry them. I didn't particularly want to carry them. Uh, would have if they'd asked, but uh, I didn't have to carry them. I used them quite a bit. I uh, used them to put the uh, fuse to and crimp it and put it in the C4. In fact, in Operation Utah, we ran out of hand grenades and uh, fighting was still pretty thick. And Sergeant Campbell wanted a couple of uh, sticks of C4 and we rigged up the C4 and put a blasting cap with a oh, couple three inches of fuse on it and I was going to light the fuse and throw it at them and we did uh, but for some reason it didn't go off we never knew if they pulled out the fuse or it didn't go off but are you carrying an M16 also uh, no uh, I had an M14 M14 uh-huh uh, we didn't we were there before the M16s were in country and the M14 was fine. Um, uh, what we found out, though, was that at 750 rounds a minute, that was 12 rounds a second. And you had a 20-round magazine, so you got a second and a half if you held the trigger back, and you only carry about 200 rounds. So uh, most of the guys tried to get automatics, but then they found out they better put it back on semi-auto. So are you engaging the enemy with your M16 at all while you're over there in that one year? I mean, did you have... Oh, yeah. You know, how close do they get to you? And give me a, maybe a, well, about a story or two. In, in Utah, uh, it was down to about 25 or 30 feet. We couldn't quite cover that last 30 feet to take out that uh, machine gun. And I can remember a Chinese grenade, a Chi-Com grenade coming through the air. 
and it was in slow motion. You, you hear about people in accidents, and this thing's coming through the air, and I'm thinking, that's, that's the end of me. And I knew there was a hole behind me, and I kind of jumped backwards head first into the hole. My legs were sticking out. I thought, well, at least it won't kill me. It might mess up my legs, but it won't kill me. But it didn't go off. And what I found out later was about a third of their grenades didn't go off, that they were just poorly made. Um, so I felt real uh, fortunate that it didn't go off because it was very close. Um, then there was another time we were out, there was a squad of us, and I, it was just before I went home. And uh, the point man, uh, somebody shot and hit a tree right by him. And we did not, we didn't think what we were doing, and we went into this backyard of a little hooch and uh, was had thorn bushes all around. There was one way in and one way out. And they opened up with two automatic weapons, um, AKs or something of that sort. And I was the last man in, so when we turned to jump behind the hedgerow, I was going to be the last man out. And the bullets are coming, it's like you see in a movie, kicking up the sand, coming right at me. And uh, one, the first one went to the left, and I'm firing my rifle. Uh, about as fast as I can pull the trigger. I couldn't see him. I was trying to see him. Uh, the jungle was real thick. Then they come back a second time, but they were a few inches to the left. And I was out, I, my, and I knew I had to turn around and run about 30 yards and get over this little dike. And I kept thinking to myself, now it doesn't matter where they shoot you, you keep running. Don't stop running. It doesn't matter if they shoot you right in the spine, you keep running. Um, of course, if they'd have shot me in the spine, that would have been it. But uh, they, uh, as I went over the dike, some bark was splattered off a tree that I went by. So again, it was uh, tremendously close. Uh, and I just, I frankly still ponder and wonder why, uh, why I didn't get hit. I mean, it, those types of things happen numerous times. Um, That's a good question for me to you is, why do you think you survived and came back and a lot of guys didn't? At the time, did you feel you were lucky? Was it your faith in God? How, why do you think you made it? All the above. Um, fortunate, lucky, wasn't my time. Um, I can go back and forth on God didn't call me or whatever, and I can argue each side of that. Um, I think it's just happenstance. I mean, I. The thing of it is, I had so many close calls that there's a part of me that thinks it was more than happenstance. Um, I had a mind-sweeping detail. We were in a little hamlet, and we had to sweep about a mile of a dirt road every morning. That was the first thing we did, and I had done it about two weeks. And uh, went back in, and I saw the lieutenant, and I said, you know, lieutenant, I haven't been to the PX. I got no shaving cream. I, I, what are we doing here? Can I get to the PX? He said, sure, young, you can go to the PX. Well, the next morning when they out, went out, they were ambushed. And the guy that was doing my job got shot five times in the chest. And when I heard that, that afternoon, I'm in Da Nang, and they called on the radio. Um, I just broke down and started sobbing. I, I don't know why I asked to go to the PX. I mean, I just, uh, what I remember too, and this is um, hard to comprehend, his last name was Young. And he was an African American, he's a black dude, come in there. And he wasn't there for about three or four days when I went to the PX and they stuck him on my spot. Um, just incredible to me. Um, what is that, luck, coincidence, God, I don't know, but um, maybe it's sixth sense, maybe some sense that tomorrow, don't go out there tomorrow. Because that happened again, um, was out on Amtrak's, about a squad and a half maybe. And the Amtrak's went into uh, to the base area to fuel up with fuel. And they took aboard, oh, I don't know, a couple, three hundred gallons of diesel fuel. And again, I went up to the lieutenant and I said, Lieutenant, I've been out for three weeks. I need a break. Look, you got some guys that ain't been out. Um, so they took me off and put another guy on. And they didn't go 500 yards and they hit a mine. That thing blew up and it killed every Marine in it. Um, and again, I don't know how to account for that. I don't, that's, uh, I just don't know how to account for that. I, I, I can't. Um, 
How would you define combat if you had to define it? What would your definition be of combat? Well, it's, it's so uh, contradictory. Combat is, is terrible and hellacious and uh, the worst nightmare you can possibly imagine. At the same time, it's exhilarating, um, tingling with excitement, uh, the danger, the risk. Uh, it's even sublime. It's so far out there that there's nothing like it. There is no comparing it to football or anything. There's nothing like it and it's it has its own fascination um the destruction the the screams the whole combat vibration is alluring it has an allure uh which is probably why we're always going to have combat and war um it's the worst time in my life and the best time in my life i i can't uh i can't say it much simpler than that and uh would I do it again? Hell no, I wouldn't. But uh, I'm glad I did. Uh, I was talking with my mother a few years ago. I uh, worked blue collar jobs. I was worked the docks in Seattle and cranes and construction. And I decided at about 40 to go back to school. And going to school was relatively easy for me. Uh, what I tell people is that I'm an intellectual. And that's not a comment on the quality of my thinking. It's a comment on what I like to do. I would just as soon read an intriguing book as do about anything. Anyway, I went back to school and I earned a doctorate from Purdue University. And my mother was asking me one time, said, well, what, what sticks out in your life? And I, I told her without hesitating, I said, being in Vietnam is the biggest thing in my life. There won't ever anything touch that. And I could tell from her look, she was kind of disappointed that probably she thought getting my doctoral degree was the biggest thing. Um, but it wasn't even close. Uh, the doctoral degree gave me opportunities, changed my life, you could say, but it didn't impact me like Vietnam did. Uh, Vietnam changed everything. And in fact, when I got home from Vietnam, um, I went back to Florida for about a year then I went up to Chicago for about a year. Then I went out to the Olympic Peninsula and lived out in the woods for quite a while. Had a Visqueen house and lived along the uh, Bogoshia River and another river that I can't think of in a national park. And the park rangers wouldn't bother us. They'd just let us stay out there. Um, ended up staying outside or living outside or being homeless for about four years. And I didn't realize I was homeless until a few years ago. And that, that may sound strange. Um, my stepfather was a professor at uh, Florida State. And uh, I went down to visit one week. And he said, they're doing a study on homeless veterans. Uh, and they're, they're wanting to talk to homeless veterans about what that was like. And I didn't say anything, but my mind was thinking, why are you telling me that? What's that, what's that to me? Why? And it took me about two weeks later to realize, well, he was telling you that because you were homeless. Um, when I was homeless, I didn't, it didn't seem homeless. I mean, it was just kind of the way it was. I didn't feel I was missing out or didn't have anything. Um, so Let me go back to Vietnam now for a second. Um, you're in combat for that year. Um, was there a more difficult part for your, of your work, I mean, that you did, or what was the most difficult thing you had to do in Vietnam? Look at the wounded and dying and the dead. Um, engaging in the firefight and the shooting part of it, the action part, I won't say it was easy, but it was certainly intriguing. I mean, it was forceful. Um, there was an incident that happened that stayed with me. Uh, I got to go back to Da Nang for a few days, and uh, while I was there, a sergeant tapped me to go on a, a garbage run. Uh, they'd take all the garbage out of the uh, mess hall, put them in these big 50-gallon drums, load them on the back of a truck, and then go out to the edge of the, uh, where we were. And there was a big pit. The bulldozers had dug a big pit, maybe 10 feet deep, with a sloping uh, thing. And uh, this truck backed up to this pit, and there were people in there um, from 6, 7 to 70. And they're standing in this slop, this god-awful slop. 
And uh, I started to pick up the drums on the truck and pushing it over, you know, dumping it into this slop pit. And the people in there had cans, and they'd hold up the cans to try to catch a good piece of the garbage. And this kid, six or seven, he picks up this piece of steak or something that was worth getting. And a 35 or 40 year old man was in there just hit him right in the head and took it from him. And uh, that was shocking to me, that they were reduced to living like that. That was a shock. And I kind of think that that gunny sergeant sent me out there because he knew that was there and he just kind of wanted to let me see it. Uh, now, of course, I don't know that, but uh, that was one of the, that was as shocking as anything. Um, and seeing how they lived was shocking. Um, uh, did you get to help the wounded at all yourself? Were there times where you could help them or help a medic or something? Or? Yeah, there were. Or a corpsman, I mean, a corpsman. There were. Um, helped load them, didn't really help put band-aids on or anything. What do you mean about loading them in the choppers? Is that a pretty chaotic scene or is it controlled or what? what you well, it's a controlled chaos, to be honest with you. Um, it's fast, the, the helicopter comes down, get them in there and get them out. Um, it was just, it was really hectic. And uh, the wounded were one thing, um, some of them may or may not have made it, but. I don't know, but it was it was the dead Marines that was disarming to me to uh, seeing those eyes that were there was no shine, no spark. I mean, just dull. Looked like a taxidermist had put those eyes in there or something. Um, that I remember a lot. Uh, How about after the war? Did it bother you the memories of all that, or you just kind of forget all that and put it away? I didn't forget it. Um, and it was certainly less bother than when it was happening, but I still think about it. It's still something that uh, I think about and have to deal with. Tell me a little bit about the drug usage over there and how you got involved in all that or when you got back um, and why. I got involved in drugs over there uh, and as to why, it was because I truly didn't know if I was going to be alive at the end of the day or if I was going to eat lunch tomorrow and somebody had some marijuana and asked me if I want some. I said, damn right. Said, yeah, I'll take some. Uh, and I think it was just because I knew time was short or suspected it could be short and I wanted to experience everything I could. And uh, I think this marijuana was probably laced with opium or something because it wasn't too long after we'd smoked it that uh, it was like being on acid or something. Things were melting and it's like disoriented. And the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, I suspect, made it real easy for troopers, Marines, to get drugs, uh, about any kind of drug you wanted. So it was prevalent. Um, I smoked it a few times there, but not often. Um, and it was when I was in Da Nang and not out in the field. But I certainly uh, developed a taste for it, if you will. And when I was discharged, I essentially went off to the West Coast about as quick as I could. Uh, and I was immersed in the drug culture for 17 years. As far as Vietnam goes, Mitchell, now, other troops and drugs, I mean, what about your, your officers? Was it condoned? I mean, how, how, give me the perception of it and how it was actually used. I've heard people say it wasn't used. I've heard them say it was used. It was never used in the field, never used in aviation units. I mean, especially in combat. You wouldn't do that before combat, right? I mean, that, um, did people do that in combat? People did do that. Really? Yes. And uh, I'm not sure that would make that much of a difference. It's not alcohol. Um, people, the people that I saw using it, the Marines that I saw, were in a rear area. We were in Da Nang in headquarters. There wasn't any, any action going on. Uh, I never saw it in the uh, field. Um, I heard a lot of stories later that it became more, much more prevalent. Uh, and in fact, I'd heard Marines later, after I was discharged, talk about smoking it in the field. And knowing they were going to get into a firefight and sharing a, a, sharing a, a number with each other and getting ready and, and getting up for the firefight. Uh, Wouldn't that affect their abilities to to be alert and help their buddies. I mean, people depend on those people, you know what I'm saying? 
Um, I don't. I don't know. I. I don't think so. To be honest with you, um, once I was discharged, I smoked a lot of marijuana, and I would go hunting. And just before we'd start hunting, I'd do a number, and I was dead-eyed dick. I could hit anything. I mean, it did not impair me at all. Um, so I think it depends on how used to it you were, how much of it you had. Um, it would not necessarily impair someone. What about other kind of drugs? Was it just marijuana? All I saw or heard about was marijuana. And they made it available? The enemy made it available? Yes. Or the Americans had it? I mean, uh, it grew over there, right? Well, yeah. And the enemy made it available. He, uh, they were fascinated with Salem cigarettes. They were fascinated with cigarettes that had menthol. That was a real treat to them. And if you had a carton of Salem's or a few pack of Salem's, um, you, they were, you could take advantage of their desire to have those cigarettes. And what I heard is a couple of three packs of Salem get you about three finger baggie of marijuana. And the marijuana that I had over there was extremely uh, potent. Um, so it was definitely around. I, I saw it, smoked it, uh, but not out in the field. And this was in 66. I left in November of 66. And from what I heard, it got worse and worse and worse. As far as combat, do you think a person can be trained to kill somebody, or do you think that's just an instinct that happens when your life's being threatened? Well, I think it's both. Um, the training will help you survive, and it'll help your instinct. Um, Training makes a difference. Uh, we were building a, uh, repairing a bridge, and we worked out there, I don't know, maybe a week or so. About the fourth or fifth day, we're having lunch. We'd stop at noon. That we should have known better. Um, we'd stop at noon each day and eat lunch in the same place. And we uh, didn't have any reports that anybody was around. And we sat down to eat lunch about the fourth day, and they opened up on us with machine guns. Um, I was sitting on a bridge abutment, and all of a sudden I see these spots appearing in the asphalt road. And it didn't take but a second or two to realize what it was. And there were three of us on a, a bridge abutment that was about two and a half, three feet high, concrete. And we all jumped down and, and hugged the ground. It's it the only term I can think of. And uh, the next sweep that that machine gun made, it was just above our heads on the concrete thing. It would have got our legs if we'd been sitting there. And that, when they made that second sweep and they got that concrete, was chipped on the back of my neck and on my back, I thought I'd had it. And I thought, I'm not going to go out cringing here on the asphalt. So I just stood up and started firing. I just said, uh, got real in a rage, just in a rage. Um, cursing and swearing and, and firing. Couldn't see nobody, but by God, I wasn't going to get shot laying there hugging the ground. Um, and that kind of changed things for me, too. So I was more aggressive after that, um, much more aggressive. So did you get shot at while you're doing all this stuff? I mean, oh, yeah, that, yeah, that's what I was just saying. Uh, you never knew. I, yeah, I got shot at a lot. Did you knock out the machine gun or whatever was shooting? Or? Yeah, we killed them. Uh, and we lined them up. There were seven NVAs in uh, North Vietnamese Army fatigues. And uh, I remember a guy named Turner jumped down in their hole and helped pull the bodies out. And uh, they lined the bodies up, and they were twitching. I don't know if, uh, if anybody knows that phrase, uh, what, like a chicken with their head cut off. Um, or if you're going hunting rabbits or squirrels, you can have a clean kill and they don't move. But a lot of times, they jerking around, flopping, and those bodies were doing the same thing. They were jerking around and flopping, and uh, it was grotesque. It was, and this uh, gunny sergeant comes up to me, and he looks at me, and I'm a private. He says, should I shoot him in the head? And I said, yeah, why not? Shoot him in the head. What the hell? And he pulled out his 45, and he went down shooting each one of them in the head. And I kind of followed him and watched, uh, watched him do that. And what kind of fascinated me was their head didn't blow apart. It was no Hollywood stuff. He shot him right in the face, right in the head. And the hole would appear, and some blood would come out. But you hear these stories, oh, it blows their head. It doesn't blow their head apart. Um, but they sure stopped flopping around on the ground. And I, they were probably all going to die or were dead, and the body was just twitching. None of them were going to survive, uh, as far as I could tell. They were 
probably already dead, but I thought it was strange that he would ask me uh, if he should go ahead and shoot him in the head. And there was another time, about the third day I was in Vietnam, um, about the third day I was in Vietnam, we come up in this little village, uh, maybe it wasn't even a village, just three or four hooches, maybe it was a family. And uh, the Arvin went, was with us, um, uh, said there was two people in this little tunnel, this little cave. Uh, it was bigger than a tunnel, you could hunch down and walk in it. And they told him, well, go in and bring him out. You, you, you're Vietnamese, tell him to come out. So he goes in and there's an explosion. And he comes staggering out. Uh, and put the story together later, uh, they were two kids. They were 12, 13 years old. My guess was brother and sister, but I don't know that. Uh, and they threw a grenade at him, but the grenade hit a root, and it bounced right back on him and blew them blew him apart. And uh, so the, some Marines went in to pull them out, and they pulled out these kids. Their arms were missing, and uh, half the face was missing. And uh, I think that when... When bodies are blown up by concussion, I think the concussion cauterizes the wound. And the people that I saw that were blown up, there wasn't much blood. And these, these kids, there wasn't any blood. The arm and the bone was sticking out and their face was gone, but there wasn't any bleeding. And I think it was cauterized by the blast. And what was sad about it was the face, I mean, you could tell these were darling kids. These were handsome and pretty and, uh, the flower of their youth. I mean, it was, and they, we laid them out there on this dike. And this sergeant that I knew, he was my sergeant. He was a good person. He was, uh, it must have bothered him because he went over and he uh, lifted up the pants of the female. And he looked at her and looked at her genitals and he says, what a waste, what a waste. And he kind of laughed. And uh, Corporal uh, Sturgeon was standing right next to me, and he said, do you know why he did that? I said, yeah, I knew why he did it. Uh, it was just a coping mechanism. Uh, if he could make a joke out of it, it wasn't so bad. Um, you know, I guess what really surprised me too, anything you could do over there to survive was okay. Um, nobody would fault you for it, or I never saw anybody fault anybody. Um, whatever you needed to do to get through the day, that was all right. Um, and there was a lot of, uh, oh, what do I want to say, a lot of things that you can't comprehend doing as a civilian that becomes the norm when you're on the battlefield. Uh, uh, that's one thing that I think bothers soldiers, and I think it always has. Um, civilians don't understand the beast within. And if you're going to be a Marine or a soldier and, and engage in, in combat, you got to be pissed off. You got to be angry, alert. I mean, you got to want to survive. Uh, and when that takes place, you become real effective uh, as a soldier, as a, as a combat person. Um, and that beast comes out and it's savage. It's as savage beyond understanding. And I think that's real difficult for a lot of soldiers to come home with. Uh, on the one hand, they would like to talk about it, but on the other hand, the savagery cannot be comprehended by a civilian. And were you to be eloquent enough and verbal enough to share it with a civilian, it's a great likelihood that you would be shunned after that because they could not understand why someone would gain, engage in the savagery that's needed to uh, see, the, see the end of the day, to make it through. Uh, and I think uh, one of the uh, civilians don't understand uh, every soldier that goes into combat pays a tremendous price, a tremendous price. Um, if I were the president, I would pass a bill that if you go into combat and you draw combat pay, you get something for the rest of your life. It might only be $100 or 50 or 150 but if you've been in combat, you'll never be the same, um, never. And we should pay these young men who do this uh, 
they're going to have trouble with friendships. They're going to have bad dreams and nightmares. They're not ever going to get over it. They can go ahead and, and accomplish some commendable things, but they're not going to get over it. They will take it home with them, um, and it will be with them till the day they die. Uh, the innocence uh, that's lost, the savagery, the, what, what it takes to survive, um, it changes you forever, and it's not a good change. Um, you've got to be cold-hearted. You've got to shut your heart and be cold to engage in that killing. And you can do that. You can shut your heart and you can engage in the killing. But what people don't understand is turning the heart back to being warm again just doesn't happen. Um, if you're going to survive, you close the heart and become hard. But when you go home, the heart's still closed. And uh, that's a problem because it stays closed for the most part. I, I agree with what I've heard you and others say. Um, I have to admit that I've heard some say that they came home, they were fine and all this stuff, and you, you kind of wonder what level of combat some of these people had because um, I, I tend to, to feel like you do and what you went through, even though I didn't do it, but just listening to you, I, I've been mm -hmm. thrown to that. I had one guy say he became an animal. Mm -hmm. In, yes. in a story, you'll hear it in the documentary, but, uh, okay, um, coming home, I mean, was there a homecoming? Was it hard transitioning from combat back into civilian life? Obviously it was. Um, yes, yeah. Uh, within 72 hours, I went from being on patrol in the jungle to being home in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, they pulled me out of there, unbeknownst to me, at noon. Uh, by the middle of that night, I was in Okinawa, gave me some new uniforms, and within 24 hours after that, I was home. Um, I didn't, uh, th my mother now tells me that when I came home, uh, it wasn't, wasn't me. Um, I weighed about 200, 210 when I went over. I came back, I was 160 pounds. Um, didn't look like me at all. And what my mom says is that I would sit in my room and just sit there and stare. Uh, and I'd, I'd just sit there and stare. I'd bought a, from the PX, if you were in Vietnam, you could buy top of the line stereo equipment and they'd just send it right to your home. And I had a top of the line uh, uh, music equipment, stereo stuff, and I'd go in there and just uh, sit there and listen to that music. Didn't want to be around anybody. Um, uh, when I look back on it, I can tell the difference, but at the time, it didn't dawn on me that I had been changed. It didn't, uh, it was just another day, um, but from... Do you remember the first time you were home, you, you laid your head on your pillow in your, in your room, and I mean, my goodness, what you had just gone through, and all the thoughts and the memories, that would be haunting, I mean, to me, to, to think about that, troubling. Did you feel at peace with yourself at that time? I think I was in such shock that being home didn't compute. Um, it just didn't compute. Uh, my mother had went back to school, and I went with her to a class, to some class. And we're sitting in this classroom, there's 30 people in there, and one whole wall was windows. And I, I, I remember thinking, this is a, a really stupid place to sit because if them windows go, it's going to shred me to pieces. And I don't, you better get out of here because if something happens, them windows blow, man, you just, you're going to be mincemeat. And then I'd say, well, what, what are you thinking that for? This, you know, it's all right. Um, and that has never left. I still do that. Um, better beware, look out if this happens or that happens. Uh, I, I still, to a certain extent, I'm in a survivor mode. Um, and I've had people say, well, that's good, that's good. Well, no, it ain't good. Um, because to be in that survivor mode, you gotta be on edge, you gotta be alert, you know, and it just doesn't ever stop. Is it hard to trust people? Um, that's a good question, and I, uh, you know, I don't know how to answer it. I want to say, yeah, it's hard to trust people, but I'm not sure what that means. Um, I'm not comfortable around people. I'm not a people person. Um, give me a few books and, and give me some shelter from the storm and I'm, I'm good to go. Uh, which is ironic because uh, I went back and got a, a doctoral 
a degree in counseling and, and I'm a clinician. And I have a lot of empathy for people who come in and let me know they're hurting. A lot of empathy. I, uh, but I don't have much empathy for whiners and complainers. Um, if we're eating outside, there'd be maybe two flies and so people would ruin their meal. They, they just can't sit and eat their meal, and I don't give a shit about the fly. I never heard anybody getting sick from the fly. Yeah, Freddie died. How come? Oh, he ate a fly at a picnic. I've never heard anybody getting sick from a fly, and they get all upset about a few flies. Uh, when we were in Vietnam, a lot of the places, the Vietnamese would sell loaves of, little loaves of bread, like a baguette, uh, and it cost a nickel. And it was really good to have it. It was fresh bread. But there's always bugs in it. You cut it open, there's bugs. There might be 15, 20, 25 little bugs in it. And the first week or so, I'd pick those bugs out. And I just stopped picking the bugs out. What the hell? They've been baked at 180 degrees. They're dead. They ain't going to bother me. I just didn't have time to pick the bugs out. It didn't matter anymore. Uh, so I guess one of the things about coming back is the whiners, the people who whine and complain about nothing. Um, I want to say I don't understand it, but I do. Uh, and I think one thing about combat, it let me know, in a sense, what I'm capable of enduring. And what I see here, especially in this day and age, are young people who have no idea what they're capable of. They're not put to the test. They're not pushed. Um, they give up too easy. They, they're not hard. We've become soft. This nation is soft. Um, I'd like to think I was a liberal for a while, but God, dog, it's gone too far, way too far. Um, I've been working with veterans. I've had, I had a contract for 12 years with the VA. I'm what's called a fee contractor. And any veteran who needs some counseling who's been in a war zone can apply, and uh, if they live in my area, they're sent to me. And uh, maybe that's why I didn't get hurt in Vietnam. Maybe. Maybe I was being safe for that or something, I don't know. Um, the veterans that I see, uh, they got problems. These kids coming home, they're coming home with no legs. They're coming home, they fucked up. They're just, they're screwed up bad. And uh, they're still only 23 or four or five and it ain't going away. Can they get married? Yeah, but it'd be rough. Uh, it, it, if a woman stays with a combat veteran, she's an angel because uh, it's hell living with them. It's been hell for my wife. Um, we all know that. These veterans I work with, they know it. Um, part of the symptoms of PTSD, because that's what we're talking about here, is isolation and withdrawal. It just goes with the territory. Um, I could go into that. I don't know if you want me to or not. Uh, yeah, I think a little bit. I, I, I've heard a lot of stories, but I think just what you said there, the withdrawal, the isolation, I mean, it's very common. And uh, Very. Common. Now, what do you say to the person, what do you say to the Vietnam vet who doesn't believe in post-traumatic stress? I've heard I, that too. I don't see them. Okay. The people that I see in my office, they're hurting. Probably 60 or 70% of them have scared themselves with their suicidal ideation. A lot of them have had the pistol out in the backyard at midnight, and it scares them so bad they finally ask for help. Um, usually when I see them, um, they're desperate, beyond desperate. What's their main concern, that nobody can understand what they've gone through, or just the horrors of war, or adjusting back to society? What's their main concern? It's real ironic, because Vietnam veterans especially have a bad name. And one of the reasons they're concerned because they know they've hurt people verbally and their behavior and lashing out and uh, unpremeditated rage. And they've hurt the people who are close to them. They've hurt their families and their children. Uh, uh, most of the vets I work with are brokenhearted about the way they treat their kids or the way they used to treat their kids. Their kids are 35 or 40 now. Uh, and they understand what they've been doing. And I think that's a big part of the despair is that they know they're different. They know that uh, they can mistreat people. Uh, they often regret it. Uh, they'll yell and scream and, and I mean really be frightening. And a couple, three hours later they realize what I, they didn't deserve that. Why did I do that? Why did I overreact? And that furthers the withdrawal. 
I don't want to treat people that way. My kids don't come see me. I haven't had a Thanksgiving or Christmas with the family for years. And I don't want to be that way now. I'm, I'm 50, 55, 60 years old, and I, I want to have some family. Uh, and I think that when you get that old, you don't have the energy to keep it buttoned up. It starts seeping out around the edges, and uh, it starts to hurt real bad. So a lot of the veterans, the Vietnam veterans, uh, are seeking help uh, in their fifth decade of life, their, their 50s and 60s. How would you define post-traumatic stress disorder? What's a, a short definition of that? It's a physiological reaction to severe trauma that deeply affects psychology. A lot of people don't think that. think, well, uh, you get PTSD is because you're weak moral character, you weren't strong, your mind... Uh, the mind reacts to our blood chemistry. Um, what I often tell students is if I could slip uh, so, uh, a time-release capsule of adrenaline in your coffee and you didn't know it and a week after you took it the, the adrenaline in your body was going to be elevated 25 percent but you didn't know that it wouldn't take too long for your mind to come around to be squared up with that adrenaline that adrenaline is going to make you nervous, irritable, on edge, looking for this. you got to bleed off what that adrenaline does to you physically, and you have to do it mentally also. So my whole sense of PTSD is it's a, a mental reaction to permanent changes in the physiology. Um, we know that the uh, endocrine system and the, the glandular systems uh, are bruised or, or seriously scarred and that causes the blood chemistry to be off and that of course then changes the psychology. Uh, oh boy, you're covering a lot of ground here. Yeah. You went through drugs for 17 years you said? Yeah. And um, that's a long time. Yeah, it didn't seem like it. I was always drugged. I mean, uh, I tell people, you know, being homeless isn't so bad if you got a bag full of drugs. You know, uh, you just up the dose a little bit and bring it on. You know, uh, Let me just, just ballpark percentage, and just for my personal use, but uh, I'm just curious, really. What percentage of Vietnam vets do you feel experienced something like you did versus didn't? With, maybe with the... 80% did, maybe more. 85, 90. Um, if they were in heavy combat over time, they had a problem. Now there's exceptions, and those exceptions are interesting. Um, given that I've spent the last 20 years of my life studying PTSD, most of us are wounded before we ever got in the Marine Corps or the Army. Um, it's a normal wound. I mean, we all get wounded because we have imperfect parents. Um, but if you're in combat, if you're an infantryman or a close support and you see enough, you have a problem. And we've defined that problem as PTSD. Uh, so you've got people in Iraq, Afghanistan coming home today that are wounded. Or, or and there's a few of them or a lot of them that are having problems? I think the ones that were in combat are having problems, having serious problems, even more so than I think the Vietnam veterans did. But there's help for them, isn't there? And there's more, they, they rotate in units, don't they? Not, not individually like you guys Yeah, did. they do do that, and that's supposed to be a help, but I'm not sure how much of a help it is. Uh, so they're, they're, these guys have seen something over there that just has affected them, right? Sure. It, imagine seeing a body that's three or four days old and it's full of maggots and you can smell it from 50 yards away. And those bodies are laying around just rotting. Anybody going to bury them? Dogs are eating on them. Rats come out of them. I mean, and these are people. I mean, it, uh, you just don't get over that. That's happening today or back in Vietnam? Both. Oh, yeah. It's been happening forever. Yeah. It happened in World War One and Two and the Civil War, all the wars. Uh, uh, I have. How come in World War II they didn't call it post-traumatic stress? Well, they didn't know enough about it. You know, that's one thing, uh, Larry, that uh, Vietnam, 
Vietnam soldiers uh, and Marines gave to this world was the designation of what PTSD is and the, uh, the study of it is helping a lot of people. The World Trade Center, those people are gonna have problems, they'll never be the same. And they, what treatment they have and what treatment will help them is in part uh, paved the way by Vietnam veterans. And uh, what we know now that we didn't know even 20, 25 years ago is if the trauma is severe enough, I know it's a very trite phrase, but the mind blows a fuse. And uh, it doesn't matter if it's Katrina, an earthquake, a train wreck, uh, combat. If the trauma is serious enough, serious enough, it's a major problem. Yeah. No, I, that's right. It could be other situations, not just war. You bet. Um, it is other situations. Uh, those people at the World Trade Center, Oklahoma City. You know the fireman, the picture of that fireman on the magazine with the baby? You heard what happened to him. He shot himself in the head. I didn't hear that. And eight others did too out of Oklahoma. I've heard that people, that's happening at World Trade Center people too. It's just more than a human can bear. Uh, An important question for me, how, how important is God in your life, faith, faith in the Lord? I mean, is that part of your life, or did that have a part to play in Vietnam or now, or how important is that to you? It didn't in Vietnam. Um, they say there's no atheist in the foxhole, but I don't know, it didn't cross my mind. I mean, it was just uh, either will or it won't. And there were times in Vietnam I thought, you know, I just, uh, I don't want to do another 10 months of this, eight months of this, seven months of this. Um, if, they, if I'm taken tomorrow, that's okay. Um, it got to that pretty quick. Uh, and I just resigned myself to it. Um, didn't give any thought to spirituality or any of that. You ask, is it in my life now? Yes and no. Um, I'm, it confuses me, I don't have an answer. I can sit on one side of the debate and say, that's ridiculous. I can sit on the other side of the debate and say, you ought to be a Christian, um, whichever mood I'm in. Um, I, I do wish that for myself, I'm not a very loving person. Um, I can do real well when I have my clinical hat on and I'm Dr. Young and you're my patient. Um, I can do real well at that. Uh, but when I'm Mitchell out in the world, I'm not a people person. Uh, I had a professor at Purdue pull me aside one day. He'd been at Purdue 30 years and he said, you know Mitchell, you don't have to be a people person to be a good therapist. And it was like he let me off the hook because I was wondering. Uh, Do you think helping other people helps you though as far as getting your mind off yourself and maybe you're more effective, like you said, in that capacity? I think I'm effective. A lot of the veterans that I work with, especially the Vietnam veterans, say, I wouldn't be here if you weren't a veteran. I wouldn't be here. Uh, clinically, I know that you can be helped by a non-vet, but I understand what they're saying. And has it helped me? You bet it's helped me. How uh, important do you think this work that I'm doing is as far as documenting these stories of history? I think it's real important to look at these aging warriors who hit Omaha Beach and Iwo Jima and to see the tears in their eyes. They're 80, they're 85, and those tears are just an eye blink away. And they've been an eye blink away their whole life. A lot of the veterans I work with, um, I ask, do you ever just break into tears? Yeah. Uh, unexpectedly, at odd times, you don't even expect it. All of a sudden, you're in tears. Yeah, yeah. Um, we had to bottle all those up. And to see those World War II veterans in tears lets you know they don't ever go away. Um, and maybe that's a good thing. Um, but as far as the history of this, I think it's important to record these stories. It is important. Um, there's nothing grand about it. There's, in fact, if, you, if we send young men and women off to uh, in harm's way, they ought to get something for the rest of their life because they'll never be the same. You know, uh, I'm going to ask you to do one more thing, if it's okay. At the, I know we could talk a lot longer, but we've done it an hour, and that's good for me. Um, I'm going to just make one more comment before I have you do this. A lot of the Vietnam vets that I talked to, they feel good after they talk to me. Some of them yeah. have never talked about it. Some of them are under care right now. 
And it, I feel like sometimes it's almost like, I almost feel like the counselor. Well, I think you are. And, and they feel better about it. They do. Um, something that I know, we have to tell our story, especially if there's trauma involved. And we have to tell the story to another person. Well, I've heard better say, I go out in the backyard by myself. That doesn't work. You have to look somebody in the eyes and tell them the story because they will help you carry your burden. And that's, so the work that you're doing is very important, tremendously important. I think there's a lot of veterans that never told the story and wouldn't have other than to you. Um, so I commend you on that. I think you're probably helping them more than you can comprehend. I would encourage you to keep it up. Good. Have you ever been to the Vietnam Wall in Washington? Yes, I have. Uh, tell me the first time you went, what you remembered and what you felt. Well, I, yes. Um, the first time I was kind of in awe, my parents met me in Washington and I went uh, because of a, a friend of mine uh, wanted to take me there, kind of. Um, he was working for Eli Lilly. He was a molecular biologist working on brain cancers. And uh, he wanted to take me there. And I went with him, but it was, uh, I was numb. Uh, I went, I took 10 veterans there about eight, nine years ago. We had a fund drive, raised the money, and 10 of us went there. Uh, me and another therapist and 10 veterans. And that was much more meaningful. The first one, I just was walking around in a daze. Uh, when I went with the other veterans, my clients, my patients, um, that was very meaningful. Power, it's a powerful place. It's become America's wailing wall. It's where we go and shed our tears, uh, whatever tears we might have, whether it's combat in Iraq or whatever it is. It's a place that we have been allowed to go to and let our humanness out. I'm going to ask you to do one more thing from where you're seated. At the end of my films you saw the other night, I'm going to ask right. you to give me a salute when I tell you into the camera. Sure, you from bet. From where you're at there. Okay, hold on. Okay, Mitchell, right into the camera. Go ahead. Great, thank you. Thank you. Stay there. I'm going to take a picture of us with this camera, okay?